Welcome everyone and thank you for being here. My name is Zoe Chanel. I'm the curator at the Rochester Center, curator for the show Carnival of the Chronic. We are joined today by three artists that are part of the show, Anna Ford, Anna Haidt, and Kim McDaniel. Before we start, I'm just gonna do a little bit of, I call it housekeeping. So the talk is about 45 minutes an hour. Uh, I'm gonna introduce the artist, ask some questions, and then hopefully we have time for Q&A after that. So if you have a question, please write it in the chat or uh, if it's more accessible for you when you have, uh, when we're in the Q&A section, you can unmute, say your name and ask the question. The show can be visited up until April, 2024. So there's still time if you are in Minnesota or uh, elsewhere. Uh, the Art Center is open Wednesday to Sunday at 11 a.m. from, from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. So this event is part of the programs for Carnivals of the Chronic, which is an exhibition, a group exhibition that features regional, national, and international artists whose work directly speaks about the experience of living with chronic illness or disability. And just for context, we'll talk about a little bit about that later, but some of the artists and artworks were selected direct, directly by me. And then some were selected through jury call that went out internationally by panel composed of medical professionals, uh, artists and curators that live or work within the framework of disability justice. And so it's a show that really kind of tries to bring brings people together around the topic that uh, society wants us to be fairly isolating. All the artists in the show, I'll just, I'm just going to mention them. So we have the two Annas, Anna Cowley Ford, Anna Haidt, Benjamin Merritt, Brother Sick, which is a duo composed by Ezra Noah Benes, Drew Maud Griffin, Emma Jones, Emma McLean, Jennifer Bastian, Kim McDaniel, Lauren Yadin, Maylin Kopehi, and Wang Sang Sit. The show is also functions as a sort of resource space where you can find resources about how to live and thrive with illness and chronic pain. So there's a multimedia library that you can see like right down here in this picture with book, podcast, and other resources where people can learn and kind of ground themselves, find mentorship and resonance. We also have a rich list of programs. Here you see one that was in person that related to the exhibition, trying to highlight the work of each artist, try to making connections among artists and also between the medical community that is big in Rochester because of Mayo Clinic and the artists that are in the show. I'm just very excited to introduce the artist. I'm going to read a little bit from their bio. So Anna Kali Ford uses a variety of media, including soft sculpture, video, medical objects, ceramic, to communicate their personal experience with chronic migraines and pain, and to address larger issues of disability, mental health, and chronic invisible illnesses. What you see here is the soft sculpture called Fatigue, and it's featured in, that is featured in Chronicles of the Chronic. This was actually one of the first pieces that I consider to have in the show. I'm just very grateful that it worked out, and I got to meet Anna through this exhibition. Anna Haidt is an artist and educator in Mississippi. She was diagnosed with, with lupus at 14, but chronic illness and disability did not feature strongly in her work until COVID-19 pandemic hit. So struck by the discussion, discussion around disability and disposability brought on by the pandemic, she was inspired to start exploring both personal and societal perception of disability in her work. And what you see here is the installation called Recovery Position. This piece was selected among uh, more than 100 artworks and uh, 81 artists who applied to the jury call. And so congratulations and thank you for submitting your work. We really, you know, it was hard, hard to choose among all these amazing artworks that were were submitted, which is grateful. Here's a shot of the installation in the gallery. Kim McDaniel is an experimental filmmaker uh, based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Choreographer and performers who use movement and gesture to explore the vulnerability of living in a sick and disabled body. She shifted from traditional dance performance to filmmaking after a head injury in her early 20s. And as you can see here, the show features her video series, Axis Strategies, 
And I had the opportunity of seeing an in-person screening of the whole series at Red Eye Theater about a year and a half ago or two years ago. And it was an incredibly cathartic and moving experience. So I'm just glad that we got to connect further through the show. So thank you. So the, the reading from the statement for the show, for the hero statement for the show. So the show presents artwork that created using a vast range of media, which we just saw a little bit right now, uh, scales and technology. And this variety acknowledged that every experience of illness and disability is unique and rooted in intersectionality. Those individual experiences also present aspects that are universal, but relatable. And the formal qualities of the work are driven by deliberate conceptual choices made by the artist. In some cases, those choices embrace the artist's disabilities uh, or whatever illness they're like managing at the moment. And I think they show an incredibly range of adaptive strategies and creativity and resilience. So in this interwoven threads that there are in the show, there's so many text-based artworks, textile artworks, and artworks that present the same books and reference the same authors. So there's many threads. One of them, one of those threads centers around the body. And historically in art, especially Western art, the representation of the sick bodies and illness were definitely not left to the sick body itself, where external, maybe a scientific gaze, something that would just scrutinize to, and often consider the body in parts and as a whole, right? I wonder how and why you uh, all included body in, in your work and how that reflects with the, the media that you, you chose to use for presenting this body. And I would like to start maybe asking Anna Ford, would that be okay? Thank you, Zoe, for organizing and including me. And it's also reminding me that I'm an artist. I've been so busy with other things happening in my life and like not feeling well. So it's like, oh yeah, right. Let's talk about artwork. Okay. So this is a really big question and one that I don't think I've ever really thought about consciously of like, how am I going to represent the body and pain? I think I kind of just go with gut instinct and then... I know I don't like being in front of the camera, so I tend to like make stand-ins to represent me that then can be altered and distorted. Yeah, it's like my biggest tool, it's my biggest hindrance, but it's also the thing that if I need a figure, I can trace myself and then create it. How's that? How's that for the first try? Oh, well, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to hear maybe Anna Height when you go. We're gonna do like an alphabetical thing. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Height. And uh, as regards to the question, I decided to represent my body this way because it it felt more authentic, I guess. I've been playing with a lot of different things in my work at the time, really delving into this archive of medical data I had accumulated, um, my own medical records, doctor's notes, scans, test results, all sorts of things. And the thing I kept coming back to was how sterile it felt. And I think that is a bit of a problem, like you noted earlier in the question, that we find it really easy, particularly when looking at historical sources, to separate person from disability and view it in a very like scientific sense. Like we just want to categorize it, dissect it, figure out things like that, and not as much focus on like the person themselves, how it makes them feel, how it impacts them. And I thought by just straight up putting my body there, that that could make more of an impact to me than all of the different doctor's notes that say, hey, this person is sick. Thank you. I think, yeah, there's so, <laughs> there's so much that I would like to respond to, but I'm going to ask him the same question and I think that it's kind of interesting what you were saying before, Anna, because I had been working on a film before I started the exit strategies that did include like medical notes and MRI images and x-rays and and it just felt like it wasn't going anywhere. Like it, I had gotten some feedback on it that people didn't really know what it was supposed to be about or it was just too abstract even. And to me, I was like, oh, like, 
I'm using these really personal documents. And to me, it was like really clear what it was about. Uh, but for some reason, there was this gap in understanding between like how intimate the documents were to me and how like explicit they were to me. And yet how that got lost in translation through the process of making and presenting it. And so I think that I think and it kind of, yeah, like I've been thinking a lot for this conversation about like, yeah, the, the mystery kind of of chronic illness. How do you demystify chronic illness? And I think that there's a lot of abstraction in, in chronic illness for me. And so it was actually like a choice to put my body and my story in front of the screen as like something that was very narrative and very like literal. And that was like a way for me to face the face like what facts there were about the situation instead of being lost in these really medical documents that like exposed me in certain ways and yet people like still didn't understand my experience. I think what I talk about a lot with these films is the way that I was framing the camera and how that was like a metaphor for my embodiment. And so I think a rule that I had for myself as I started making these, because I used to be a dancer, then I got hurt and I was in too much pain to continue dancing. So I had this rule for myself that when I was making these films, I couldn't hurt myself to make them. And I wasn't always that good at that, but it it was something that I kept coming back to where I was like, I'm not going to hurt myself to make this film. And so I think that I tried doing other things besides putting my body in front of the camera as a way of trying to avoid hurting myself. So I was working with like objects, trying to find like improvisation with nature and objects and working with text on screen and working with other dancers that weren't hurt ways of collaborating beyond my body as a way of trying to not hurt myself further and really that was like the goal working in film was to not hurt anymore so yeah I, I think that I point the camera in a lot of the films the camera's pointed down and I didn't know why I was choosing that framing at the time it was just like a really intuitive choice but when I look back on it now I had so much and I, I still do struggle with this, this pain kind of like all around my neck and my head area. And it was the first couple of years after the injury, I couldn't look up. It, was, it just like, I, there was this huge pain in like extending my neck and looking at the ceiling. And so the camera actually became like this metaphor for my own embodiment. So even if my body wasn't in front of the camera, the camera was acting as my body and throughout all six of the films there's you see the camera has this like point of view where it's pointed down over and over and over again and after I was done making them I was like oh yeah that's because I was looking down for years I was looking down because I was in too much pain to look up yeah I think I mean I love I, I love hearing the insights of like yeah why why we see a certain kind of shot not here that like you were hurting obviously but yeah, I think that that was kind of the the creativity that I was talking about before. And that sort of cre creative way of navigating a professional artistic work, then it translates into life too. How do I not hurt myself? Like, how do I not re-traumatize myself and still manage to be in, in society, right? So thank you. Just going back to some of the threads that are in the exhibition, uh, another one that I that kind of emerged and uh, I definitely see in in all three of your works is this sort of demystifi demystification of invisible symptoms. One of them, for example, is fatigue, but also mental illness and how that is impacted by living with chronic pain and just recognizing uh, all these unnoticed uh, unspoken aspects of being ill. So my question is, why is visibility and sort of invisibility such a fertile ground and also sort of like a battlefield for your work uh, and also for the community and so for other artists who work with this, starting from those teams? Like this is such a huge question and I, I don't like, it's so daunting visibility, such a fertile ground for chronic and visible illness, which is what I'm often trying to represent. Like there is such a barrier for people to have empathy or even under trying to understand that there could be something going on here. 
And there's such a range of health conditions and sensations that could be conveyed and they're different and unique for everyone. So I kind of see that as like the fertile ground, the short battlefield. I mean, I, I'm, I just don't have a good answer for these. <laughs> yeah, maybe on a height you want to, um, yeah. Pitching. I think it kind of does go back a little to the last question where we talked about the like data, the history, the dissecting part of illness, how like they want some people want something physical to see about it because that's kind of how they think about disability. They think it should be something like really glaringly obvious that separates you from other people and when something is invisible that really throws a wrench in it and makes people question the validity of something because if if they can't see it then is it is it really there and what i kind of do in my work is i try and find a way to show that invisibility while still like keeping it from feeling voyeuristic to me because there's also that air of voyeurism with putting yourself in art or looking at disabled bodies in art because you know you see videos about it on the internet all sorts of things people have a fascination with the visibly disabled body they have the, there's a fascination with it and it's not always a great fascination so i'm trying to display myself and display the things that i have my chronic illness everything without making myself a a object I guess for something to be like oh my god look at her all this stuff I, I want it to be more of like a blank slate the viewer can kind of apply themselves to and and that's where like some form I think somebody mentioned abstraction at one point like when like some form of abstraction like kind of comes to be helpful in that thank you yeah Kim where to respond to that I think I, I yeah just build off of what Anna the Annas I have said in one of like my artist statements I th I say something like I don't pretend like in my work I I don't want to pretend that I know or can solve the mystery of chronic pain and I think for me that's there's so much that is unknown like about my body that I feel like medical professionals really want to diagnose or give up about. And yet at the end of the day, I'm the one that is left to be hurting or dealing with it. So I think that my work, I do try to leave things unknown. And I think that that's why I gravitate towards more experimental work, experimental narrative, because there's not a like requirement in that type of work to have an ending and it leaves questions open in the narrative for people to like bring their own experiences to and then that to me is like when the dialogue can happen is when there are threads that are left open for people to meet on their own and I and within that it also makes me I feel like as a maker a little bit vulnerable because it does like open you up to people who do have biases or judgments about illness or whatever they think about disability themselves and they can bring that to you but for me that's also as long as it's within kind of like a spectrum of me being able to handle it in a specific way I still think that that's productive because that's like a conversation that wouldn't be had otherwise and could be educational in in that sense for both of us but especially a person who thinks that disability is only people who use mobility devices or have, you know, an impairment that they can see. So yeah, I think I, I was thinking about this the other day and the last exit strategy, so like exit strategy five got accepted into Superfest, which is like a disability film festival out in Berkeley. And to me, that was like a really big moment for me because I think that that film I kind of talk about chronic pain, but it's for me, it's actually more of like a generational film about like how I have inherited my mom's pain and like how I have taken on her traumas too, and how that has contributed to my own physical chronic illnesses that I deal with. So for me, it felt like a really abstract disability film 
that I feel like some, especially in disability studies, it's such a new field. And I think that there is kind of this tentativeness when talking about chronic illness in disability studies. So when the film got into super fast, I was like, whoa, like, you know, I'm, be I'm, I'm being seen and like validated by a disability community that I, I didn't feel a part of before. Well, congratulations on that. Yay. I mean, I think my my next question, it kind of touches on like things that you all uh, have a little, a little bit like talked about already. So maybe like, we can just like take a little deeper on that. You were talking about even offering this room for this voyeuristic gaze to like be there, right? Or being exposed to the bias of, of people who are just going to look at your work. So um, do you, have you found any sort of strategies, way, or like, it's something that works for you to like uh, consider care when you present the work in a gallery, in a film festival or such, uh, and that care being for people who might, you know, be traumatized or by seeing some, some of the, the, some of the things like talking about pain, it's personal, it's hard, right? But also taking care of yourself. What are your boundaries? What are the things that, yeah, what are the things that help you like put out work without that being an harmful experience for you? So I guess I might start with the like boundaries for self when I'm presenting work because it is so much rooted in my experience with chronic pain and that's always there and present. I think initially when I was making work about this, I was constantly, oh, what about this? Oh, what about that? What is this sensation? What is that on a scale of zero to 10? That wasn't healthy. Um, and so with time, kind of having boundaries for myself, when do I relive those sensations and when do I not so that I'm not constantly reliving it? So there's kind of that brainstorming stage where I am usually incapacitated by whatever pain and that's kind of how I'm getting through it is just okay how do I make the most of this how do I imagine explaining this to someone who's never experienced it and then when I'm no longer experiencing it myself then I'm have moved on to problem solving stage or the material tests and having that kind of separation has helped me a lot care for viewers I probably should work better at because I'm often trying to make the viewer feel uncomfortable and feel discomfort, you know, but I don't want to give anyone a migraine. So instead of like, if I'm wanting flashing or flickering lights, I will slow it down to like a glacial pace of just like slowly changing light colors. Yeah. Those were my thoughts on that one. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I also like definitely for the fatigue piece, it's like I always think like using that that media, it's just makes it very accessible in a way. It's accessible. Yeah. Well, and I do I really do want people to be able to interact with the work and touch it. Like I don't want that barrier of like, oh, I have to stay three feet away. Like, no, I want you to touch it. And like the feet and the hands of fatigue are filled with cotton batting. So they're also like giant pillows. You could cuddle up with it and take a nap. So that kind of interactivity I do is important for my work um, with the viewer. Thank you. Um, Anna Haidt, wanna? For me, as far as things go, I purposely wanted the piece to be subtle and I think that helps a little with like the care aspect the viewer doesn't need to like have some photorealistic photo of me on the bed and see my face grimacing in pain or hear me like wheezing or whatever they don't need to see as much the pain thing I like that if you had not if it wasn't already in a exhibition like this where we're talking about chronic pain, chronic illness, disability, you might not even really know what it's about until you actually walk up and read the title. And I liked that. I liked the solidity of it. And I think that does help. It's something that is not too 
visually tough to look at as far as like context and things. I always advocate for people to like, if, if, if something is too much for you in the moment, walk away. You can always take a step back, take the time you need. The art will still be there. When you're, when you're back, like I've always advocated that. I try and do that with myself. I'll admit I'm not the best at realizing in the moment when I've had too much. I've, for better or worse, over the years gotten really good at compartmentalizing and then not feeling things until later, just kind of from different environments I've lived in. So that's been a work in progress. And a lot of times I just try and look up art a little beforehand or look up movies or things or th stuff like that beforehand to kind of get a little preview taste of what it is and decide for myself whether I need to like prepare myself before I go in or whether maybe I should just skip that one for now, things like that. I try to be really proactive because I know in the moment I'm probably just going to stonewall if it's too much. Yeah, and I think... Uh, again, even even for your work too, that sort of not knowing exactly what the installation is about and having the sort of spectrum, how could you read this before reading the statement, right? Uh, it definitely makes it, I think, more inclusive, more accessible. Yeah, and then there's so many layers that can be read into the work, right, from the use of the meat, cyanotype, references to artists, other art, contemporary artworks, right, that talk about beds <laughs> in some forms so yeah and also I want to say that one of the discussions that we had when selecting your work is that a lot of people submitted work about beds the bed was it's a thing uh, so it's just it's, a lot it's, of time in them yeah exactly so mm -hmm. it felt good to include uh, a work that you know has many layers but also has that sort of symbol or space or that that we you know we all know about and the you know frankly ill disabled uh, community yeah what about you Kim I was just thinking how I have a bed in the in one of my videos <laughs> it's there um yeah I think I was thinking how I use performance and beauty as like mediation tools for thinking about overwhelm or content that might be difficult uh, I studied with Cecilia Condit who uses song and like fairy tales as a way of like mediating traumatic kind of experiences for her in her own life and I wish that I could be a, uh <laughs> for many years I think I tried adopting that style um and just realized like I'm not a musical person like it's just not my thing so I think though that coming from a performance background and I think that I do gravitate towards things that are performative and that in some ways is a defense mechanism. Like it's almost like it acts, the performance is a barrier actually. And I think the beauty of images and shots is also like a barrier for me where it's kind of like, okay, I'm going to be talking about something that's really difficult, but also it's juxtaposed with this like really beautiful shot of these birds at sunset and they're going to fly away from this pole and you're kind of left watching the wires hang and at you know and move at dusk so there's kind of like space and tension for everything to be included and i think too like within that especially when i'm thinking about the performance of a voiceover or like what gets included in these stories i think that i'm protected because i know that I'm presenting this five minute film that tells a story about something that happened. And that is still 5% of reality for me. So it's like this moment, this snapshot in time, and it's still not the entire situation. And I think that that's some of like the, the beauty of working in, in film and video is like, you can kind of decide and edit what to include or not. And in that way, I'm still protected film has helped me become an owner of my narrative and like a, in, the, in that way I'm able to reclaim how, what's being told and how it's being told and a lot of that is through the performance of the voice or the body for other people I mean I think I know this is like really kind of like a contested like conversation in film I know like some people don't do any trigger warnings 
And then I know people who do a lot of trigger warnings. It's like you can uh, you can do as much as you can, but at the end of the day, you have to take care of yourself. And then by taking care of yourself, you take care of others. So I can give the trigger warning and then it's ultimately in other people's hands what they want to do. And I don't take a lot of responsibility for that. Um, you know, I can be responsible and do the warning. And then, and then for me, it's out of my hands, really. At the the la the just the last thing I'll say is the the end of the strategies that's installed something called the coda, and there's a dance section with karaoke <laughs> to the Robin, and I that that section that little three minute segment only plays when the five play before it. That for me was within this ideology of I'm going to take care of myself, and by doing that, I hope to take care of others too. And so I was thinking, okay, if I'm ever in a scenario where I'm watching all five of these play back to back, first of all, it's going to be like 40 minutes and I'm going to be, I'm probably going to be in pain because if I sit that long, I'm in pain. So I'm like, I'm going to want to get up or I'm going to want to move or do something to like move the pain, the pain around. And at the same time, like I really do believe that movement and healing are hand in hand. And so I'm going to be tired of watching my films. <laughs> I'm going to be in pain by the time this is over. And also I'm going to want to like do something about it. So like, why don't I build in something that asks people to move their bodies, um, to shift in their seats or to stand up if they're able and to engage with music and with other people in the room and kind of have this like celebration of like, you listen this long and now we party. And that was really like in the effort of taking care of myself and also wanting to celebrate with others in community. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, yeah, I got the chance to like, like see that had like be part of that screening and I was definitely not expecting the dancing moment at the end. And I was also in pyjama not wanting to go out that night. I was literally, I'm drug myself to the theater and I was in pain. I was just didn't want to be there. I'm very glad they did and the the ending was yeah it was that moment of pain is not sometimes it's not going anywhere what are you supposed to do you got to find some joy in it and something for yourself and something for others so I do really appreciate how you think about including the body even with the media that it's supposed to be just like I'm watching something right like kind of like more like a passive kind of thing so yeah so I like to open up uh, now for questions from the audience. So if you have questions, please drop them in the chat or feel free to unmute and ask them. Uh, I'm going to be dropping in the chat some uh, information about uh, future programs uh, before uh, the talk is over. So if you're interested in more talks like this, uh, there'll be more. I think community has been mentioned uh, by, you know, maybe all of you at one point uh, in this chat. And it was one of the things that I really wanted to like somehow bring up, bring out in the show. There's several people who think about this uh, and speak about this loudly and the stigma around illness needs to go away because it's really hard by itself. We don't need it. Nobody needs it, right? Might as well just get that mentorship because sooner or later we all get sick. So yay, right? I wonder what is... Like, have you find any sense of self community in in your experience of illness or disability or all of that? Is the community aspiration or is or like something that actually is a reality in your life? I think I have a community. It's mostly online, and I think online is a great tool as we are using right now. But I was able to find a lot of people with other like chronic illnesses online who are willing to talk about their experience but also it's nice to be able to talk to someone who gets it if that makes sense it's it's good to talk with people who also know what it means to say like yeah I technically didn't really like go out and like run a marathon today I mostly stayed at home but I'm still so exhausted I'm, I just feel like I ran a marathon even though I didn't and then being like yeah no I get it it's just it's it's one of those days you know it's good to talk to someone who gets it. I think community provides that. And I think there's a lot to be said just for being listened to. Because we have a lot of people out in the world who will tell you a lot of things and not want to listen to you say what you want to say just because it might be hard to physically see what you're talking about. Thank you. 
Yeah, and there's, there's there's forms of definitely the internet like provides some forms of accessibility for people. Even just the being able to do this. Does any of like Anna Ford or Kim want to say something about it? Otherwise, we have a, a question from Mandy. I would say that I'm so grateful for meeting you. So, like through through this like network, and I think that we find each other. I feel like people in the disability community, especially like in the arts community, like somehow like we find one another, <laughs> like, and it's like not something that I've intentionally like sought out at points in my life. But then when I look back and realize the people that I'm closest to, they're all people who deal with disability in their life in some form. And so it's, I look back and I'm like, even when I wasn't intentionally trying to build community, trying to find people who are disabled or trying to find that somehow I cultivated it unconsciously because that's just who I connect with. Now that I'm in a place in my life where I am claiming disability and I am being more intentional about like the communities that I'm in, it's been really healing yeah I think a lot of the communities are online or it's been really hard in Salt Lake to find that here and so I think that that's been something that yeah I mean I know COVID was like really terrible for so many people and for me it was like kind of the first time in my life where I was like oh it seems like the world is understanding what it's like to be lonely for the first time or something and I was like it was like kind of shocking to me how it was like this n- new experience for a lot of people to not be able to go out or to cancel things or to have to go online to talk to people. And I was like, I've been doing this for years. And I think I held a little bit of anger and like resentment about that actually, where I'm like, oh, this is so hard for everybody. You know, I, but when it's like, I've been working like this for years. I just hope that, yeah, the world doesn't forget about COVID and the actually the, some of the really positive things that grew out of being having so many people be sick um, and I, I don't want us to erase that from our history and forget once more how many of us are sick. Yeah, thank you for bringing that conversation up. It's definitely uh, incorporated, in, I think, in several of the art, artworks in the show of masking still a practice for the part of the disabled community, right? Currently, the whole community. Uh, and the, yeah, like, can we find connection without compromising the body? And we have Francine says, uh, I couldn't agree. We do more, Kim, and dealing with our certainty during COVID, some, something that we all uh, are used to. So, yeah. Thank you, Francine. Would you like to say something about this, Anna? Like, no pressure. Just, <laughs> I, I just, I know, I know you're like, you're not doing great. So it's like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm so um, short and concise today. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> yeah, I, I live really rurally. So my community is also mostly, it's either friends or family or people online. Yeah, just having a support network is integral. And reminders that this is real, this is valid, is really helpful. (laughs) But I'm really excited about Mandy's question in the chat. (laughs) (laughs) Which is, does race and gender play a part in your work and how? Yeah, I think gender, both of those play a role because they can't not be present. Um, Even if they're not at the forefront, they're still imbued in the work. Gender is definitely present in my work because women's pain is just not taken as seriously as men's. But at the same time, I'm white. And so my pain is taken more seriously seriously than if I was a person of color. I think too, with making work about care, gender is there um, because of how our society molds gender roles and how women are kind of instilled to be more caregivers. And so then if you're also a person in pain, with that like caregiver tendency, I don't know, it like, it all kind of speaks to each other. 
And then I think two genders present in like some of my material choices, like sewing, using my bed sheets. And now I'm like really intentional about my bed sheets when I buy them because I know they're going to turn into a sculpture. And so I'm I'm getting intentional with color choices and what they mean. So like in about five to ten years, there's going to be a pink figure. I love to hear that. Can't wait for the pink figure. <laughs> Anna or Kim, want to like, have something to say about this, Mandy's question? Sure. So part of the goal, I think I mentioned earlier, was to have the piece be something someone could transplant themselves onto. And part of why I like cyanotype is because it's blue. I think that's a pretty accessible color. It's not skin toned because if it was like just a printout photo of me, then it becomes about me but with the silhouette and because um I used a photogram method where you use a physical object instead of like a film or something and the object being my body it left it really vague like it's really hard to tell the gender of the person on the blanket or sheet rather um it's really hard to tell all those things especially because with how the pillow dipped and stuff you can't really super well see my long hair which we usually try to identify with women um so I, I wanted it to be vague so that anyone could really try and transplant themselves on there a little easier whether they are white like me or black or Asian or what have you whether they're a man a woman on binary etc I, I wanted it to be something anyone could feel like they could they could associate with I'll just hop right in after that yeah I think uh, I've been thinking about a couple of things for this question so one of the films has to do with physical therapy and an experience that I had with a, a female physical therapist and I still fall I still fall into this idea that like, females are going to be more kind to me in a medical setting and it actually the worst experiences I've ever had has been with female providers. The most trauma I've ever experienced has been with female people. And I don't know. And it's funny because I was just in physical therapy for something else like a couple months ago. And I started with a female provider and it was going terribly. And then I, I have an anxiety about working with male providers. You know, there was a guy, he had an opening. I took it. It was really nice to me you know, it was fine for them as fine as a physical therapist appointment can be. Right. So like still super ableist and all this stuff, but he wasn't like mean. And that's what I need. I don't know if it's this dynamic of men are a little bit apprehensive because they don't want to cross a boundary it has something to do with my age and my gender. Um, something to do with the way that I look, they're a little bit nervous. Maybe they don't want to cross a line, you know, that, that is more easily understood from a male to female dynamic than there is from a female to female dynamic. But it's something that I, I just remembered when I started seeing the male physical therapist where I was, you know, he's not touching me. And, and he says, you know, I'm not going to touch you. And, and that's what I want. I don't want anybody to touch me. <laughs> so it's kind of like, there's this apprehension and I think that it has a lot to do with gender and how our society has constructed authority in relationship to gender. I think though, like just beyond that, that like this, these films are the reason I came out. Like, I never would have come out as queer if I like didn't make these films. I mean, I feel like this is where art has such like an intimate relationship with my life. And the fifth film in the series is the film where I'm like, I'm gay. <laughs> And like, like, this is me like coming out, I guess. And so I think the, there's this intersection with being presenting femme and Ellie Claire, who's a disability uh, activist, writes about this, but kind of the intersection of being a queer femme and also invisibly disabled and kind of like the relationship between invisibilities in that where you don't look like you're gay and you don't look like you're disabled. And yet you are. And so it's this like continual process of like coming out based on how you look. So yeah, I think in terms of gender, there's like a lot there. And in terms of race, I think when I was making these films, I carried and still carry a lot of guilt. It feels like as a white person, I'm taking up a lot of space 
about my experience. And it was something that I had to do a lot of work, internal work on in myself about like, where did that guilt come from? How do I work with that in myself and my practice? And I think that when I was thinking of like the audience for these films, like my ideal audience or something for these films, I'm like, it would be like a 12 to 13 year old girl, lower middle class girl. This is my ideal audience for these films. And it's somebody who was probably like, looks like me and is dealing with some of those things that I dealt with as a child that shaped my pain and who I am today. And I think that if I had watched these films as a 13 year old little white girl who had so many closeted fucking problems, <laughs> like not only about like eating disorders, but like generational trauma. And I grew up in a really conservative, Republican, religious, Christianity, Catholic, like really intense stuff that really ingrained a lot of ideas that I've had to, that I spent my whole 20s breaking apart. And I think that if I had had access to these films earlier, or these ideas in the films earlier, I could have, my development about anti-racist work, about anti-ableist work, about being an ally for the, for people of color in the, in the community, I feel like that would have happened so much earlier in my life. So I got exposed to that when I was in my, in college and in my twenties, I've had to do that transformative work in my young adult life. And I wish that I had had access to that earlier. I want the films to be for everybody, but then when I think about my ideal audience, I'm like, I want that transformation to happen for teenagers. And then I want them to know that they're seen and that change can happen earlier. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, I don't know, you just all say so many things. It's hard to like find a good close in here where I just want to keep chatting, <laughs> but I'm gonna let you go back to your lives. I think just being part of the show, I really appreciate that, you know, with whatever thing is going on in your life, you made time to submit the work, to chat with me and to be part of this. We are lucky that the show is up for a long time and we have a really great team of volunteers and staff who are engaging with children in school, uh, visitors who are in Rochester for Mayo Clinic primarily and just residents and medical community. So some of those conversations that we have today hopefully get to an audience. And so thank you for making work and being generous with it. Also, Mandy says, uh, thank you for the diverse replies and touch on vulnerability, materiality, universe universality, and perception of other things. And thank you, Mandy, for a really good question. Before we close, I'm going to post here upcoming programs. Uh, so other opportunities to like just keep talking about those things in a some sort of public setting. And yeah, I just want to thank you, Anna, Anna and Kim for your time today. And yeah, again, for me, he work and be involved with this project. Thank, thank you, Zoe. Yeah, thank you. This has been great. I'm, I'm very thankful to be a part of this. Yeah, thank you.